presentation is going to be over mechanical ventilators. We may not go over every detail in this chapter, but there's some important points I think we need to understand as we go. Learning objectives. Discuss the basic design features of ventilators. Classify ventilators and describe how they work. Define what constitutes a mode of ventilation classify and discuss modes of ventilation. Explain the indications for the basic modes of ventilatory support. Describe the application of selected modes of mechanical ventilation. I want to take you a minute to your textbook. This is the first paragraph under the key terms. I find it interesting that he puts this right up front and so this should grab your attention. I'm just going to read this straight from the book. To initiate and manage a mechanical ventilator safely and effectively, the respiratory therapist must thoroughly understand three things. Number one, ventilator design, classification, and operation. Number two, appropriate clinical application of ventilatory modes. In essence, the proper matching of ventilatory capability and physiologic need. And number three, the physiologic effects of mechanical ventilation, including gas exchange and pulmonary mechanics. Then continuing on with the slideshow, the control circuit is first topic. We're not talking about the breathing circuit here. This is like the electronic circuit inside the ventilator. But this is a system that allows ventilator to manipulate pressure, volume, and flow. They may be composed of mechanical, pneumatic, electric, electronic, or fluidic controls. Most modern day ventilators combine two or more and there may be advantages to components used. For example, uh, if you have to take a ventilator in, into MRI, you can't have any metal in it because of that giant magnet that they use there. The fluidic controls have no metal in them, so they would be the type you would want to use if you were taking a patient to MRI. And most of them will say MRI compatible. Control variables. Inside that circuit, that control circuit, we have some control variables. The primary variable, ventilator controls to cause inspiration, there are three of them. We're going to talk about each of them individually, but they are pressure, volume, and flow. Only one of these can be controlled, and the other two become dependent variables. The pressure controller, the ventilator controls the pressure, but the volume and flow vary with changes in compliance and resistance. The pressure waveform will be square, or referred to as a constant waveform, during inspiration positive or negative pressure is controlled. In essence, the iron lung controls the negative pressure. The volume controller, the ventilator controls the volume, so the volume will be constant. And since flow is volume over time, flow is also constant. Pressure will vary with changes in compliance and resistance. Flow controller, Again, as above, the flow is volume over time, so volume is constant, and pressure varies with the changes in compliance and resistance. Some old neonatal ventilators use flow interruption to deliver volume during inspiration. And we'll see this with our IV-100 in the lab. I want to talk about the flow trigger for just a second. Flow triggers are becoming more and more popular on machines simply because they are more sensitive to the patient's effort. The way these things work, they're a little bit different than the other than the pressure trigger. The pressure trigger, I can refer you to the IPPB machine and just watch the needle deflect you know, to minus two or minus three. And once that sensitivity pressure is met, then the breath is delivered. It's a little bit different on the flow trigger in that 
in flow triggering, the clinician usually sets both a base continuous flow and a trigger flow level. Typically, the trigger flow is set at one to three liters per minute below baseline. If the base continuous flow is set at 10 liters per minute and the trigger is set at two, the ventilator triggers a breath when the output flow decreases to eight liters a minute or less. So let me give you an idea of how this works. The ventilator sends a flow through the circuit continuously. This flow is not intended for ventilation, but just to recognize when the, the patient has an effort. So like the example says, it, it may send 10 liters in there, and sometimes that's adjustable. You have a 10 liter flow occurring continuously. The ventilator itself monitors this flow both going out and coming back of the ventilator. So you have 10 liters going out, and when the patient's not making effort, you have 10 liters coming back because it just makes the circle there. Once the patient makes an effort, then that flow coming back is disrupted or decreased depending on the patient's effort. So as we set this, as we set a two liter flow, as we set this, we set a two liter trigger once that return flow gets to eight liters or less, then the breath is triggered. Compared with pressure, using flow as the trigger variable decreases the patient's work of breathing. However, ventilators that use the flow triggering mechanism tend to be highly susceptible to circuit leaks or movement caused by turbulence of gas flow through condensed water. Phase variables. The ventilator uses variables to initiate or limit each phase of ventilation. What we're talking about here is the different phases of ventilation. Inspiration, initiation of inspiration. In other words, you're changing from exhalation to inspiration. The inspiration itself and then end of inspiration, in other words, changing from inspiration to expiration, and then expiration. Initiation of inspiration, in other words, the triggering of the breath. Trigger variables are machine or patient triggered. In the machine trigger, the variable is time, and so this is determined by the rate control. So if you have a rate set at 10 breaths per minute, what that means is the machine's gonna deliver an, an inspiration every six seconds. If it's patient triggered, it can be either set at pressure or flow, and even volume, although I've never seen that. Most ventilators provide a manual breath button that op the operator activates, and so as long as you push the button, however many times you push the button, that's how many breaths the patient's going to get. So again, those are the, the three trigger variables, time, pressure, and flow. Inspiration, the target variable. These limit the inspiration but do not terminate the phase. In other words, if you have pressure-limited breath, this limits the peak pressure during inspiration you have volume limited, limits the amount of tidal volume delivered during inspiration to a set amount, or flow limited, limits the amount of flow during inspiration. So what's the cause of the end of inspiration? These are called cycle variables. When you terminate the inspiration, it's referred to as cycling. Pressure cycle, inspiration terminates as a preset pressure is reached. And this may be the alarm when you hit the pressure limit alarm. Volume cycling, inspiration terminates at a preset tidal volume. Flow cycle, inspiration terminates when the flow drops to a preset value. And then time cycle, 
Inspiration terminates when set inspiratory time is reached, and this includes any inspiratory holes. So cycling mechanisms are pressure, volume, flow, and time. The baseline variable, and this is kind of some terminology if you will, this is defined how the base, baseline or end expiratory pressure relates to atmospheric pressure. PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. NEEP is negative or subatmospheric end expiratory pressure. And ZEEP is zero end expiratory pressure or equal to atmospheric pressure. The primary breath control variable. Volume control. The tidal volume and flow are set while the pressure is dependent on the settings and pulmonary mechanics. Pressure control, the pressure is set, the tidal volume and flow depend on the, the pressure setting and the pulmonary mechanics, like compliance and resistance. The dual control, this is a mixture of volume and pressure, either start in the volume control and end in pressure control or the reverse. So many times this dual control, and this is becoming more and more popular because it seems to be better for the, the patient minimizing the pressure required Typically what happens here is you set the tidal volume as a target. And what happens is the pressure is adjusted to achieve the target. Let me give you an example. Let's say our patient has a tidal volume of 500 set. In this dual control type thing, the patient can actually take a larger volume than 500 if, if they want to cough or if they want to yawn or if they want to sigh for some, whatever reason it doesn't matter. Let's say on one breath they take they get a volume of 650 mLs. Well on the very next breath what happens is the machine recognizes that that's too high in compared to the 500 and decreases the amount of pressure accordingly. So what happens as as you continue breathing the pressure is adjusted from breath to breath. Always move the pressure to achieve the target volume. Two types of breath, spontaneous or mandatory. So again, I'm going to ask you, why are you breathing spontaneous right now? This is where the patient triggers and cycles the breath. The patient's effort may be supported within that breath, but they are responsible for the initiation of the breath and how big the breath is, then it is a spontaneous breath. For the mandatory breaths, you have where the ventilator initiates the breath, which is kind of a control type setting, and the ventilator cycles the breath, which is an assist type setting. So many times we refer under the mandatory breaths, we have two different types of breaths. We have what we call a controlled breath where the patient has no effort or we have an assisted breath where the patient initiates or triggers the breath but the machine cycles it. Box 42-1 kind of gives you an algorithm defining spontaneous and mandatory breaths. So what you see here is is any part of this patient related. Is inspiration patient triggered? Is inspiration patient cycled? If either one of those answers are no, then the breath is mandatory. The modes of ventilation. Three possible sequences of breaths. You have CMV, you have CSV, or you have IMV. CMV is controlled mandatory ventilation and all breaths are mandatory or we can consider this full support like what we use in phase one of ventilation, right? The patient and machine initiated breaths are the same. So you have mechanical breaths or manual breaths or assisted breaths, but they're the same as far as volume is concerned. Number two, the CSV all breaths are spontaneous. So in this case, the patient triggers and cycles all breaths. 
and then you have IMV breaths can be mandatory or, or spontaneous in IMV. So what happens here is you have a set rate and a set tidal volume. That's kind of the guarantee, right? Whatever I set here with the, with the IMV is guaranteed, but anything beyond that is the patient's responsibility. And so they can go more than the IMV settings. Volume beyond that or that minute ventilation beyond that is not guaranteed. In figure 42-9 on page 1020, there are some instances where uh, you can have both mandatory and spontaneous breaths occurring simultaneously. And a lot of times this is on the bi-level mode and that's, or something that represents that, whether it's called bi-level or something else. But what happens here is you see that during the mandatory breath, you have a spontaneous effort applied on top of that so then that allows both, okay? Or you can have it between, or just a mandatory breath by itself. The upper portion of this may be a supported type breath where it is actually spontaneous, but it's supported by pressure support or something like that. Where the lower level here is just truly a spontaneous effort. You see you have the negative deflection and a very minimal positive deflection. And so that, that more represents an unsupported type spontaneous breath. So here's a pretty good table describing the modes where if you have if you're in volume control, you have continuous mandatory ventilation or intermittent mandatory ventilation. And you see the abbreviation there begins with a VC standing for volume control. In pressure control, you have the same options there, and, and the abbreviation is then PC-CMV, in other words, pressure control. And then if you have a dual control where one of them becomes a target, well, that abbreviation then is DC-CMV, or dual control. The importance of defining modes, modern ventilators, the modes may look similar on graphics, but must be set up differently. A clear understanding and definition of each mode will avoid potential dangerous patient ventilator management. So you have to know how the machine is going to respond to the patient's extra efforts, if it responds at all. The waveforms. Ventilator graphics are to ventilator management as to EKGs are to the managing of the heart. And so these are very very valuable in that they can you can determ make determinations just by looking at the graphics, and I don't have to go look at numbers or look up a, a history. I just look at the waveform, and it gives you just a wealth of information. Here's three different waveforms. You have pressure, volume, and flow. And each of these represent a single breath. Each breath has a pressure, volume, and flow. So as we look at these, let's just look at the breath under A. This is a constant pressure generator. You see how the, the pressure waveform is square or flat, if you will, as compared to the others, generates that pressure generates this volume or this volume generates that pressure depending on how you have it set up. Is it volume ventilation or is it pressure ventilation? And then flow, if you notice, flow is the only one that has a um, positive and negative deflection. The reason that is is because the negative deflection represents exhalation. The mode CMV, continuous mandatory ventilation, also known as assist control. This provides total ventilatory support. All breaths are mandatory with preset values. You can have either volume or pressure breaths. You have to set a breath rate. You may have to set an inspiratory time can be patient or time-triggered breaths. If set too sensitive, 
the machine will auto cycle, which results in hyperventilation, gas trapping, and patient anxiety. So what happens here in assist control? This is where you have a mandatory, this guarantee type thing, where you have a guaranteed tidal volume for every breath, doesn't matter if it's patient triggered or time triggered, but the difference is, is the rate, how many breaths per minute do we have the machine set to give a breath, and then the patient can take more than what we have set, however, the tidal volume is guaranteed. That's assist control. So as long as the respiratory rate is above the guarantee level, what we have set, then uh, the machine is working in the assist mode. If it falls below that guaranteed rate, then the machine kicks in and controls the rate and d delivers them the guaranteed amount. Continuing on here with uh, assist control or volume control CMV. The indication here is when a precise minute ventilation or CO2 is therapeutically essential. It may have better distribution of ventilation than pressure control in the lung regions with unequal compliance. This is a specialty at the MBRC. This is one of the things they like to ask you about. When you have a patient that's receiving pressure control and you're having a hard time controlling the CO2 level, then you're just going to dump the pressure control, change them to volume, and you'll get better control of the CO2. Altered pulmonary mechanics cause changes in peak inspiratory pressure. It doesn't change the volume or the flow. It changes the peak pressure. Careful patient monitoring allows precise, predictable physiologic results and is probably the most commonly used mode that we see today and especially more than pressure control. The pressure control version of assist control the indications here are refractory hypoxemia. The reason this works is it may have a better distribution of ventilation than volume control in lung regions that have unequal airway resistance. You'll have variation in tidal volumes due to air leaks being minimized. Most of the ventilation that occurs in the nursery is done by pressure ventilation. And so that's what this is about. The variation in the tidal volume due to air leaks is minimized. In the nursery, the endotracheal tubes don't have cuffs on them. So the air leaks that you're going to have, because there's no cuff, the air leaks are minimized when you use pressure ventilation. The pressure wave forms, expands the lungs quicker. This results in a higher mean airway pressure and this will improve oxygenation due to that higher airway pressure. Changes in pulmonary mechanics alter the tidal volume and thus offer little control over minute ventilation. So typically when you see this, is it's not when you need precise CO2 management. It's more for a lung protective strategy when your plateau pressure is above 30 during volume ventilation. Then you change to pressure control and make sure that that pressure remains below 30 all the time. So you protect the lung tissue itself. When your situation is resolved, when you don't have the pressure problems anymore, then you can change to volume control and gain precise control of the CO2 and then as you wean the patient. Dual control modes, Egan says they remain controversial modes of ventilation with little data to support its superiority in any given clinical situation. In fact, one of the instructors when I went to school was working for a company called Event. That's a brand of ventilator. Event, kind of like iPhone. He held a position, and he was one of a few that, it, that got to do this. Their job was to travel around the world. Anytime there was a pulmonary conference put on, 
discussing new research or new methods or whatever, they attended that conference. A lot of times this individual gives talks at the state convention here in Texas. And one of the things that I, that I get out of this, and they'll tell you this right, right up front, is that the mode really doesn't change the outcome for the patient. So you can get all these fancy dancy modes that has all these different technologies that are applied and, and maybe numerous technologies, doesn't matter. The mode does not change the outcome for the patient. That's what the research says. Intermittent mandatory ventilation provides partial support. IMV allows or requires the patient to do part of the work. The rate sets the number of mandatory breaths, or what I'm going to refer to as the guaranteed breaths. If the patient breathes above those guaranteed breaths, the breaths are spontaneous at the patient's desired tidal volume. During the assisted breaths, there's two options here to trigger the mechanical breaths here. You have either time-triggered or patient-triggered. If it's time-triggered, it's a controlled breath. If it's patient triggered, the mandatory breaths are called synchronized IMV or SIMV breaths. In fact, that's what's most of the time you're going to hear this mode called SIMV, but Egan says that there's no such thing as IMV anymore as it, from the original IMV, and all modes like this are synchronized. So he just drops the S in SIMV and calls it IMV. Now what happens here during this assisted breath is there's what we call a window of opportunity before it's time to deliver a controlled breath. Remember control breath is delivered on time. Just before it's time to deliver a controlled breath, a window of opportunity opens up and if the patient makes an effort inside that window then the breath is delivered as an assisted breath. If the patient does not make an effort during that window, then the machine delivers a controlled breath. SIMV generally has a lower airway pressure than assist control simply because those spontaneous breaths are just that. They're spontaneous and they, they occur just around the baseline. However, the drawback on the SIMV is that, that it may extend your ventilator weaning. In other words, it may take longer to wean the patient than from assist control to CPAP. Indications for volume control IMV. Patients with relatively normal lung function that are expected to wean rapidly. In essence, post-op patients with increased capability rate is decreased while tidal volume is constant. In other words, as they start waking up from the anesthesia. Patient spontaneous tidal volume variable tends to be small as compared to the mechanical breaths. And the mechanical breaths tend to prevent atelectasis. As you have the patient on IV, you typically don't have to take them all the way to a rate of zero when you're weaning them. Once you get them down to a rate of four or less, the patient is considered for a spontaneous breathing trial or extubation. That holds true at the NBRC too. In SIMV, you don't have to wean them below a rate of four. You can extubate them from there if their weaning parameters are sufficient. Maybe I should talk about weaning from IMV a little before we move on. What happens here is typically from phase one to phase three. Remember in phase one you provide full support. Phase two is for recovery and then phase three is for weaning. So as you begin weaning this patient in SIMV, typically what you do is, is you leave the tidal volume alone. You don't change the tidal volume but what you do is, is you d start decreasing the guaranteed rate, what we have set on the machine. And so let's say if we started at a rate of 12, we typically decrease that in increments of 2. So we go from 12 to 10, 
if they tolerate that okay from 10 to 8 and 8 to 6 and so forth and then once we get down to 4 if everything looks okay then we can extubate them from that point in pressure control IMV the indication here is patients this patient spontaneous efforts is important but often initiated when oxygen has been an issue in volume control and this is the way we typically see this is when someone we're having a problem oxygenating someone then we'll switch them to pressure control and so that increases their their mean airway pressure and improves their oxygenation the way that you wean this is you gradually decrease the pressure and the rate the peak inspiratory pressure decreases as compliance improves. You've heard of high frequency ventilation where the rates are you know, up in the range of 300 or so. That's a form of pressure control IMV. High frequency IMV, jet ventilation or oscillatory ventilation. Oscillatory meaning that it provides both inspiration and expiration, not just inspiration. So high frequency jet ventilation or high frequency oscillation, oscillatory ventilation. These modes deliver rapid small breaths on top of spontaneous breaths. High frequency jet ventilation delivers pulses of gas via special double lumen in the tracheal tube and exhalation is passive. High frequency oscillation ventilation is an active inspiration and expiration facilitated by the forward and reverse action of a diaphragm. In other words, it's kind of like a piston in there. When the piston moves forward, it gives you inspiration, and when it moves backward, it causes exhalation. Remember that CSV is spontaneous ventilation, so we're talking about pressure control spontaneous ventilation. In this mode, the patient initiates and ends each breath because it's spontaneous. The level of support determines the patient's work of breathing. So pressure control spontaneous is indicator for those not requiring full support. It does reduce the work of breathing and improve oxygenation by preventing atelectasis. Many times we refer to this idea as pressure support ventilation. And recall that there's two indications for pressure support. One is to overcome the resistance of the airway. That's the primary indication. The secondary indication is to give the, the patient a little larger tidal volume than what they could get on their own. And so either way, that's a re reduction in the work of breathing. CPAP provides no ventilatory assistance may improve lung compliance, thus decreasing work of breathing by alveolar recruitment. Primarily maintains the physiologic PEEP, and most of the time that is from three to five centimeters of water. If set higher, risk of alveolar distension and air trapping occur. May result in circulatory impairment, hindering cardiac output and oxygen delivery. Now, because this is a continuous pressure, you're more likely to have blood pressure issues or barrel trauma issues than, say, just intermittent positive pressure. He has to throw this in here about these complications at 3 to 5. In reality, what you can do is you have to watch these things, but you can go significantly higher, especially in the ICU setting, because if there is a blood pressure issue that comes about, we have some medications that we can increase the blood pressure with. If you're having a problem oxygenating the patient, you can increase the PEEP or increase the CPAP, either, whatever, whichever one you're using, and you can go up as high as, as you can until you get one of two things. One is you relieve your hypoxemia, or number two, you start having blood pressure problems where you're watching, actually watching your blood pressure. And then you typically can go back to the previous setting. As you're, as you're working your way up, you get to the point where you're having a blood pressure problem. Well, then you go to the previous setting where they were being successful, and that's where you would leave it.
We briefly touched about pressure support ventilation earlier, but this is a form of spontaneous ventilation that assists the patient effort. At low levels, this reduces or eliminates ventilator or artificial airway imposed worker breathing. In other words, it overcomes the resistance of the airway. At high levels, it may actually assume all the work of the breathing, where you have a decreased respiratory rate and improved tidal volume. This may reduce fatigue and oxygen consumption. However, it is a truly spontaneous mode and so the patient must have an effort here. If the patient doesn't have an effort, then they will go apneic. In pressure support, you don't offer a rate. All you offer is some support during the breath. Now I want to go back in your book a little here and address a couple of things. I want to talk about the calculation of the total cycle time, the inspiratory time, and the expiratory time. Now from this also we're going to come up with an IE ratio. But first of all we have to think about the times involved. The total cycle time is calculated like this. Now remember total cycle time we're talking about a single breath. The time that's allotted for inspiration and expiration. A single breath. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide the respiratory rate into 60 seconds and that'll tell us how much time we have for a single breath. Now inside that breath we dedicate some time for inspiration and then whatever's left over is going to be time for expiration. Very important there. It, depending on the ventilator that you have, you may have a setting for I time and the setting for E time. Most of the time, it's just an I time. In some cases, you won't even have a setting for I time. It may just be determined by the flow. So that's the reason we need to talk about this. So once you come up with the total cycle time, you can determine the inspiratory time and the expiratory time. So check the digital display to verify that the set frequency remains at 25 breaths per minute. And then this is how long you have per breath. In this case you have 2.4 seconds per breath. We have to divvy that 2.4 seconds up between inspiration and expiration. So how much eye time do we have? Let's say, for example, we have a one second I time. All that's left over here from the 2.4 seconds is we subtract out the inspiratory time of one second. That leaves us 1.4 seconds for expiratory time. In addition, that gives us an I ratio of 1 to 1.4. The I ratio then is calculated by dividing both of these values by the inspiratory time. Typically our inspiratory time is referred to as 1, so we make the calculation to where the I time is 1, and so it's read like 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4. That's typically the way we do it. Occasionally we have a circumstance where we actually want to inverse the I ratio and make the I time longer than the expiratory time and we call this an inverse I ratio where now we have a it may be designated in a couple of ways it, it may say 2 to 1 I ratio or a 1 to 0.5 both of those would represent the same ratio and you can stop the video here and read this scenario Basically what it's about is the inspiratory hold. Some of the older generation ventilators actually have an inspiratory hold that you can program in to have on every breath. And, and we know that we need to have these inspiratory holds available so that we can get a plateau pressure 
and calculate static compliance. Some of the older machines actually had uh, a setting that you could actually have an inspiratory hold on every breath. And in fact, we used to do that. But now they don't do that consistently because it increases the mean airway pressure and can lead to lung damage, tissue damage. So that's, that's what this is about, the inspiratory hold issue. If you have that option, then you go in and turn it off. So you need to always be asking yourself, is that inspiratory hold on there? It also increases the inspiratory time. Most of the ventilators these days, the newer ones, don't have that option to, to set that for every breath, though. Another rule of thumb about thinking between eye time and tidal volume. Now, you use these two ideas, the flow and volume, to come up with the eye time. And so what we're going to visualize here is we're going to use a water faucet to fill the sink. The faster you turn on the water faucet, in other words, the faster the flow and the longer the time, the greater the volume. Okay. So as we adjust our flow, let's, let's say our, our tidal volume is, does not change. And so the size of the sink does not change. If we open that faucet, just to where it's trickling into the sink, it's going to take much longer to fill that sink than if we open the faucet up all the way. So that's kind of the thinking that you need to use when you're talking about inspiratory time. Inspiratory time is the time it takes to fill the sink, or inspiratory time is the time it takes to deliver the breath. Same concept there. And so that, that's a good visual when you're talking about eye time. Another topic we need to discuss is the waveform for delivering the flow. The flow waveform occurs only during inspiration when we're delivering the breath. And remember, flow is our faucet. And so while we're filling the sink there, we don't necessarily have to have the flow the same while we're filling that sink. And so neither do we have to have that the same when we're delivering a breath. Typically, what we refer to as the flow pattern describes how the flow reacts throughout the delivery of the breath. In other words, if it's a ramp, you can visualize a ramp. That's what occurs with the flow. It ramps up. So in most of these, you have to also consider the peak flow setting peak flow. So if you have a peak flow set at 50, that means that the flow rate will never go above 50. In the rectangular setting, and I'll address each of these now, the, the flow is going to be constant. In other words, we have a rectangle type. And so uh, the flow is going to be constant at 50. And I'm just going to use 50 for all these examples. It doesn't necessarily have to be 50, but just so that we have we can compare between the different waveforms. So the rectangle, the breath is going to inhalation is going to start at 50 liters a minute, and is going to be maintained at 50 liters throughout the inspiration. For the ramp waveform, you may have an either an, an accelerating or decelerating pattern. Typically, the most therapeutic is the decelerating ramp, uh, simply because uh, as you start to put the breath in, it's going the fastest at the beginning. In other words, if your peak pressure is 50, right at the beginning of the breath, it starts at 50 and then decays down from there. And so if you think about it, the way that the air encounters the airway, the trachea is the largest with the least resistance and so it will handle a higher flow in the beginning and as the air approaches the as the tidal volume approaches the alveoli then a lower flow is, is better so it starts at 50 and decays from there and so usually that is the best waveform to use for most patients occasionally you'll find one that another one works but but not very often. 
So here's a nice little representation of a ventilator graphics information page. And this, in fact, this looks like it's from a Draeger. I can't promise that, but it looks very similar. And so I want to point out a couple of things here. The title volume delivery, and I, I want to look here at the at the pressure waveform. Can you make out which one's the pressure and which one's the flow and which one's the volume? But this one is the pressure waveform. The pressure waveform, looking at that, you can see the inspiratory time and the expiratory time. And down here towards the bottom, you can actually see the, the IE ratio that that creates. Looking at the flow, remember that flow typically has the positive and negative def deflection. And in this instance, we have a little delay before exhalation is allowed. And so I'll kind of zoom in on that and show you that what that looks like. Typically, don't, we don't want that delay. That's kind of an inspiratory hold type setting. And we want exhalation to occur immediately after inspiration ends. Another thing we need to make sure that happens is we want the flow to get all the way back to baseline here before the next inspiration occurs. If the flow doesn't go back to baseline before the next inspiration occurs, then we have air trapping. Then the next one is the volume graphic. And you see in, in this case, the volume graphic, all the volumes are not consistent, are they? So probably what happens is because this is in SINV, they probably have it set up in an auto flow. You see the auto flow setting there. The volume becomes a target and the pressure is adjusted accordingly. And we're just talking about that. As we talk about some of the different types of ventilators, occasionally you're going to run across a home care ventilator. If, if someone's dependent on the ventilator, where they're on a ventilator at home, then they may actually come to the hospital on their ventilator. Now, in addition, if you do home care, you're going to, probably going to have a patient or some patients that have ventilators at home, and so you have to become familiar with those. They're typically smaller and don't offer all the bells and whistles that we would have in our ICU setting. I've seen some of these things that just they're just like contraptions that are piecemealed together because they are very expensive and, and so they, you don't always get the, the nice ones. So sometimes you got to figure out what's going on with them. In addition, you may have transport ventilators that may be volume ventilators, they may be pressure ventilators. You just kind of have to know, be familiar with the brand that you have and they're, they're typically more compact and may require special circuitry and again, more training there, because this is what you're gonna, you're gonna transport like from ER to ICU or ICU to X-ray or to surgery or, or anywhere in between. And so many times these will latch onto the, the bed rail or actually sit in the bed with the patient, ventilate the patient during the transport. And many times during the procedure that's, that's required, whether that's a CT scan or an X-ray or a lung scan or whatever. Just remember that uh, if you have to go to MRI, your ventilator actually has to be MRI compatible because of that giant magnet. Non-invasive ventilators, and we touched on this previously about non-invasive ventilation. This is where you don't have an airway. Uh, the patient interface now is a mask. Many of the ICU ventilators have a non-invasive option on them. And you may also have a non-invasive ventilator itself, like the Vision. In fact, we just got one here at the school. Uh, somebody donated one to us. And so it's solely a non-invasive ventilator. And so these have a little bit different settings on them or, or things that you need to pay attention to. For example, most of these non-invasive ventilators require a leak through the mask or an exhalation port so that's something that you, that you need to be aware of, that that leak is typically required in, in that type of setup.